Our New Testament reading for today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all to any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. Create in each of us a pure and clean heart and put a right spirit in us so that we may do your work now and always. Amen. Have you ever noticed in First of all, can you hear me okay? Does this volume work? Okay, just so I, I have a gauge. Have you ever noticed that there's things that happen in TVs, TV and movies, it's, it's a reality that's different from the reality in which we live. Let me give you some examples. In TV and movies, all dogs are immortal. <laughs> all grocery shopping bags are paper, and they have to contain at least one loaf of French bread. The, the ventilation system of any building is a perfect hiding place. No one will ever think to look for you in there. And you can get to any other part of a building easily and without any trouble through any ventilation system. You will survive any battle in a war unless you make the mistake of showing a picture of your girlfriend back home. The Eiffel Tower can be seen from any window in Paris. If a large pane of glass is visible, someone must go flying through it. A car that crashes will always burst into flames. These are truths in TV. A couple more. All bombs are fitted with electronic timing devices with large readouts so you know exactly when the bomb will explode. A policeman cannot solve a case unless he has first been suspended from duty. When fighting a lot of people at one time, they are only allowed to ta attack you one by one. <laughs> and you can always park right outside any building you are visiting, especially in New York City. <laughs> we know all these things to be true in the movies and in the TV because it's been that way for 100,000 years. And we have come to accept that. And we have come to expect that when we watch these shows. And the same is true with the church. Everybody thinks they know what the church is all about and how we all should be behaving and acting as Christians. And sometimes those who think they know are as accurate as the reality shown in movies and television. Today's scripture is printed quite clear, clearly because the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Everyone knows that at church we study the teachings, we fellowship together, we break bread together, meaning sharing in meals and celebrating communion, and of course all Christians pray. So since we're doing that, we're supposed to be doing that, let's look at these activities. Let's look at what the first early church was doing in these four activities. This Excuse me, this scripture takes place immediately following the events of that first Pentecost. It explains how the church responded to the arrival of the Holy Spirit. There was a unity, there was a connectedness that brought the Spirit of God together. In his book, The Acts of the Apostle, David Peterson says, Luke implies that the church in Jerusalem was a model of what could happen when people were bound together by a belief in the gospel and an understanding of its implications and an enjoyment of its blessings. 
When a congregation is linked together in Christ, there is that sense of community, of discipleship, of worship, of mutual support. We are not simply a group of Christians that come here to worship. We are a family, bound and rooted in the love of God. We are unified in the common purpose of spreading that love of God to everyone. That means serving God in the world and supporting one another in the faith. Scripture instructs us how to do that. Teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Well, let's look at them. First, there is teaching. The Bible verse actually says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. The apostles were qualified to teach because they had literally learned at the feet of Jesus himself and they could give a first-hand account of his ministry. Christianity was, its in, was in its infancy and having those on hand who were personally trained by its founder gave the apostles and those first Christians validity. The early Christians needed to be encouraged and taught the basics of this new faith. And what better way to do this than by listening to and reaching out in faith to those who had actually been with Christ. The second, the early church was one of fellowship. Those first Christians were in fellowship with one another because they shared together. This included things that they had in common. It included the sharing of their possessions, the responsibility of helping anyone who had a need. The church shared that love of Christ that empowers those who believe to grow in their faith to go out and serve God in the world. Next was the breaking of bread together. Now in verses 46 and 47, Luke states, They broke bread together at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having a good will towards all people. This can mean that they found love, acceptance, and a way to praise God by the common bond of eating a meal in fellowship with one another. But when Luke says they broke bread together, it can also mean the sharing of communion. The Book of Order of the Presbyterian Church says this, at the Lord's table the church is renewed and empowered by the memory of Christ's life, death and resurrection, sustained by Christ's pledge of undying love and continuing presence with God's people, sealed in God's covenant of grace through partaking of Christ's self-offering. The early church in breaking bread together stay focused in their love for one another, as well as in their zeal for Jesus. And the final tradition that the early church practiced was prayer. This church faced different challenges than we do today. There was the difficulty of beginning this new institution, this religion, this, this continuing to follow Jesus. There was persecution, and this put their faith in great danger. Those first Christians knew that they could not live and do anything without the reliance of God. And as difficult as their lives were, they could face the challenges because the first thing they did was to go to God in prayer. The early church was one of fellowship and prayer. It was sharing, it was worship. And with everything they were doing and everything they were accomplishing, it was also a happy church. The list of what those first Christians were doing in the church can be applied to the church today. It can be applied to this church today. The church is a place of fellowship because it is here that we can grow together in Christ. Think of all the things this church does in fellowship. The people it reaches out to, the meals that it has, the, the energy that is created simply in this place before and after worship. This is a fellowshipping community. The church today needs to be a praying church because that is how we connect to God. 
I haven't counted how many prayers do we say in worship on a Sunday morning and prayer chains and prayer lists and lists in the bulletin and people that we're always uplifting other than ourselves. We need to move forward as a church by being a praying church. The church is a sharing church. We share when we are responsible for one another when we grow in the faith. Definitely a church needs to be one to share everything, to uplift in moments of despair, to celebrate in times of joy, and to share our daily lives with one another. The church needs to be a place of worship. In this place, tradition meets praise. Tradition, the celebrating of communion, the coming to the table to remember all that Christ did, does, and will forever do for his people. And the church should be a happy place. A gloomy Christian is a contradiction in terms. When you come here to this place of worship, I hope you feel that this is a happy, praying, sharing, worshiping, fellowshipping church. This is a place Again, I hope you feel a place where those first Christians would be proud. A place that has a positive energy. A place where Christ's message is being lived out. This should be a place of solace. A place where there is a spirit of cooperation. A place where differing views can be respected. A place where God is welcome. A place where we do everything in remembrance of Christ. For this to be God's church at work in the world, each of us needs to have that same mindset of those first Christians. That same passion, that same connectedness, that same determination. That determination that puts Christ, each other, and the needs of the church first. Personal agendas and selfish needs and prideful acts, they need to be way down on the <coughs> list when we are an active, loving church. Our minds and hearts need to be focused so that our perspective and our attitude is of Christ. Here is how our hearts and minds should be linked. This is what we should be thinking about when we come to church. It's not, what did I get out of church today? It should be, what did I give to God in church today? It's not about the church serving our needs. It is about how we are serving God. It is not about receiving mercy. It is about being merciful. It is not about giving money to the church, it's about giving ourselves to Christ. And it's not about being on a difficult path, it's about walking alongside someone to ease their journey. It's not about us at all, it's about doing Christ's work, period. And that begins with us being worthy of the title of Christian. Now one fine day there were four people who were flying in one of those small engine airplanes. There was the pilot, there was the smartest man in the world who had gone through a ritual and an instruction and a, and a contest to earn that title of being the smartest man in the world. There was a grandmother and there was a teenager. And they're all flying, seeing the sights high above the clouds. And the pilot turns to them and says, folks, I've got some bad news and I've got some worse news. The bad news is, we're out of gas. We're going down, we're going to crash. Now the worst news is, I've only got three parachutes. And then the pilot said, but I have a family and I have a responsibility and people are counting on me, so I need to take one of those. And he grabs a parachute, he jumps out the plane. Sorry, Rick, it's just a story. It's just, <laughs> just, <laughs> Forgot you were sitting there, sorry. <laughs> it's just kind of the way it goes. So, so, uh, so he's gone and he's got the parachute and off he goes. And then the next one to make their case is the smartest man in the world. And he says, I can't go down with this plane. People need me. I'm the smartest man in the world. What if I'm the one who cures cancer? 
What if I'm the one that invents the next best thing in the world? What if I'm the one that can create world peace? I'm too valuable in this world to go down with the plane, so he grabs one and off he goes. And the grandmother looks at the teenager and she says, you know what? I've lived a very good life. I've made my peace with God. I'm in a good place. I'm older than you are. And you've got your whole life ahead of you. Take the parachute and go. The teenager looks very intently at the grandmother, touched by her words. And he says, relax, man. The smartest man in the world just jumped out the plane with my back. <laughs> the, the smartest man in the world had a title. He had a reputation. He had something to live up to. And in that plane and in that moment and in that decision, he did not live up to the title that was bestowed upon him. We have titles put on others, whether we like it or not. In this church, in this place, we are given titles of Christians, of Presbyterians, of Poland Presbyterians. We are given the title of children of God. And it is important for us to show God's glory by living up to that title so that we can praise God, so that we can be with God, so that we can take God's message to this world. There's a, there's a hymn, there's a song that's entitled, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. That's our command to do in this world for God. And we can do that by the way we fellowship, by the way that we share, by the way that we break bread together, by the way that we pray, by the way that we care, and by being happy. Let us pray. Gracious God, help us this day to be your people in this world. Give us the privilege and the honor to live by the title of being your children. We pray this in your name. Amen.